Need some GED RLA practice? Then you're in the right place. Hi, this is Parker from Dust Prep Champions, teaching you how to pass the GED fast, and you can get started by clicking subscribe down below. So today in this video, we're going to cover some of the free language arts practice questions that they give out on the GED testing service website. And we're going to look at these questions here and there are going to be passages to read. So I just want to say that I'm going to read at a moderate pace here. But if my reading speed happens to be too slow for you, you can always speed up the video. And if my reading speed is too fast for you, then note that you can pause the video, take the time, take your time, take all the time you need to read. And so just note that I know that listening to these passages in this video is going to be tedious, but try to be a champion. Don't be a quitter. Don't give up. Stick it out because this is going to really help you get to know what's going to be on the GED test. It's going to help you raise your score on GED RLA, and I'm going to be throwing out a lot of cool tips and tricks and strategies along the way. So let's get started right now. Okay, question one. Which quotation from the passage supports the idea that Supit is teaching the narrator a skill that requires patience? A. I will be too busy to drink. B. Each step was exaggerated and painfully slow. C. When we were boys, we practiced with rhinoceroses when they were asleep. Or D. The tribe taught me to stalk many animals. All right, so I'm going to make the text a little bit bigger, and we are going to read this passage here. Uh, so let's get into it. Lessons on the savanna. I'm not so worried about time anymore, I said. He smiled. Good. You are making progress. Come with me. He led me to a tree not, not far from the camp. You must climb as high as you can and find a comfortable branch where you can look out over the savanna. He handed me the water gourd. You will need this. I took the gourd. What about you? I will be too busy to drink, he said. I didn't know what he meant by this, but I climbed the bone dry tree anyway and found a large branch near the top that was comfortable. Can you see the grass of the savanna? Sapit yelled up to me, and I'm just going to pronounce the names however they roll off the tongue. Yes, I shouted back. Good. What else do you see? Here we go again, I thought. I looked carefully. Shimmering waves of heat created mirages in the distance. I saw three copples within a half mile of each other. Trees dotted the landscape, and there were several small groups of animals grazing on the dry grass of the savanna. About 150 yards away, a herd of zebras took advantage of the shade of an acacia tree. A few hundred feet past the herd were a few more trees, and underneath them were two rhinoceroses sleeping. I told Sapit what I saw. Watch me, he said, and remember, this will take some time. If you lose track of where I am, look to the zebras and work your way back to where you saw me last time. I will, I said, still confused about what was going on. Sapit walked briskly out into the savanna, then stopped. He slipped off his sandals and shuka, then reached down for something I couldn't quite see and rubbed it all over his body. When he finished, he lay down and rolled on the ground, then got back to his feet. From head to toes, he was covered with red dust and blended in perfectly with his surroundings. For several minutes, he stood perfectly still, looking at the zebras beneath the acacia tree. Then he began to move very slowly in their direction. His movement reminded me of the mimes I had seen in Central Park. Each step was exaggerated and painfully slow. Sometimes he froze mid-step, holding his leg up for several minutes before putting his foot gently on the ground. The closer he got to the zebras, the slower he went. Twice I took my eyes off him and had trouble finding him again. When he was 25 feet away from the zebras, they still gave no sign that they, were, that they knew where he was there. It was incredible. They swished their tails at the flies and looked out over the savanna as if nothing were happening. I waited for Sapit to rush in on them, but instead he moved even more slowly. In fact, the only way I could tell he was moving was by looking at the spot he had previously occupied. He literally inched his way toward them. I wondered how long it had taken him to perfect the technique. If Sapit could move himself, could make himself essentially invisible, he could do just about anything, including make it rain. Finally, he was close enough to one zebra to touch it, which he did, slapping it on the butt. The zebras jumped around in confusion, then in panic, bolted across the savanna. Sapit stood under the acacia tree, laughing at the joke he had played them on them. I climbed down and jogged over to see him. When I got up to him, 
I told him that it was the most amazing thing I had ever seen. It's actually a game, he said. When we were boys, we practiced with rhinoceroses when they were asleep. The first boy places a rock on the rhinoceros's back without waking it. The next boy takes the first boy's rock and places his own rock on the back and so on until someone makes a mistake and wakes the rhinoceros. And my parents used to worry about some of the things my friend and I did in New York City. It's great fun, Zapete said, until the animal wakes up, that is. He laughed. Rhinoceroses are easy. Rhinoceroses have few enemies and are not as alert as animals they preyed upon. The tribe taught me to stalk many other animals. You must be exhausted, I said. I could use a drink of water. I handed him the gourd and he took a big drink. Would you like to learn? Yes. All right, he said, but by the time we finish, it will be too late to travel. I don't care. Good. We will stalk the rhinoceros up by those trees. Try not to wake them, though. Good safety tip, I thought. Okay, we're going to update this later. All right, so basically... And I know it is kind of dull. In fact, Tommy's actually out. He didn't make it. He fell asleep. So thank you for sticking with me. This is going to be worth your while here uh, to learn this. So let's go back to the question here. So again, let me minimize the text here a little bit. And the question is asking us uh, about which passage supports the idea that Sapit is teaching the narrator a skill that requires patience. One, I will be too busy to drink. So if we find this part in the passage, right, it's in line number six. I will be too busy to drink. So if we look at what's going on in this scene here, okay, and you can pause the video if you want, and you can reread four, five, and six, and seven if you like, um, but nothing going on here. We're not really seeing any skill that we would say reasonably that requires patience. Okay, so what about B? Each step was exaggerated and painfully slow. So just look at the word choice in B here, words like exaggerated and painfully slow. So this quotation right here, just based off of these words, because if something is painfully slow and exaggerated, okay, if those words, right, that seems to imply that the skill or whatever is going on in this part of the story requires patience. So something that's painfully slow logically requires great patience, right? So this is looking like it's going to be the answer. But let's look at C. When we were boys, we practiced with rhinoceroses when they were asleep. Okay, so let's look at this part in the passage. All right, so let me search for that. So we're talking about with rhinoceroses. So here it is. It's actually a game, he said. So if it's a game, do games require great patience? Well, I guess if it's a game like chess or something like that, right? Um, but typically, a game is going to be something that's fun. All right, so also note here that he says that he also says farther down, rhinoceroses are easy. Rhinoceroses have few enemies and are not as alert as animals that are preyed upon. Right? So if rhinoceroses are easy, okay, it, does stalking them, is that going to require great patience? Well, we don't see that directly from the text, so we can eliminate this answer choice here. Now what about this? The tribe taught me to stalk many other animals. So this answer looks like it could be right. And so for questions on the RLA test, what I recommend is to read each answer choice. If you can't remember which part of the passage it came from, definitely go back into the passage and read the surrounding sentences until you have an understanding of it. And some of the, the answer choices you'll be able to eliminate right off the bat here, right? Like, I will be too busy to drink. Okay, that doesn't really have anything to do with teaching a skill that requires patience, right? Um, but also... Okay, you might see multiple answer choices that look like they can be right. Just remember that there is only one answer choice. So if you see multiple answer choices that look like they could be the correct answer, just remember that, well, they may all seem to be right. Okay, there's only one right. So remember that you're looking for the one that seems like it's most right. So the tribe taught me to stalk many other animals. Yeah, logically that seems like that might require great patience, right? Um, so that could be correct, but we also have to see... Each step was exaggerated and painfully slow. Okay, and that in the text here, right, that comes out of part where he's watching, right? He's watching Pete in that part, right? Because he says, each step was exaggerated and painfully slow. Sometimes he froze mid-step, holding his leg up for several minutes before putting his foot gently on the ground, right? So that sounds like something that would require great patience. So this is going to be our correct answer. Okay. 
So the answer rationale, it points to the word choice. The word exaggerated and the phrase painfully slow paint to how the activity is drawn out over an extended period of time and therefore require great patience. Okay, excellent. All right, so let's move on to the next question. Which fact can the reader infer about the narrator? So we're still working out of the same passage here. So let's look at the answer choices. He is experienced in working with animals. Well, right off the bat, right, there's so much stuff that the narrator is learning here. Okay, so he's learning about animals, and Speed's telling him a lot about animals, and there's multiple portions where he's asking questions about the animals, right? Or he's showing interest in learning something about the animals, right? So, clearly, we, we wouldn't logically conclude here that he's experienced with working with animals, all right? So we can rule that one out. He is in a hurry to reach his next destination. So, in this case, right, there's multiple pieces of evidence in the text that directly contradict this, right? So right off the bat, the narrator says, I'm not so worried about time anymore. So if you're not worried about time, okay, you're not going to be concerned about being, you're not going to be in a hurry to reach your next destination, okay? All right, so now if we go down further, right, there's also something at the end where, uh, yes, here it is, this sentence here. All right, he said, but by the time we finish, it'll be too late to travel. I don't care, says the narrator. Okay, so clearly, all right, there's no evidence here that he's in a hurry to reach his next destination. In fact, there's a couple times at the text where the narrator expresses that he either doesn't care about the time or he's not worried about it. Okay, so let's consider this one. He was nervous about traveling in the savannah. So, again, we want to think about word choice and we want to think about different things that are happening in the text. So, we don't really see any evidence that he's nervous about traveling to the savannah, right? I don't can't think of any words that uh, like anxious or any words that are that sound like they would have something to do with nervous, right? So when whenever you're thinking about a question like this, right, he was nervous about traveling in the savannah. You want to remember that the author that wrote this piece, okay, he chose words for a specific purpose, okay, and so if we don't see words like think of some synonyms, which or words that mean the same thing as nervous, so things like anxious or worried, okay? And so we don't really see those kind of words here, and we don't really see any evidence in the text that he's worried about traveling in the savannah. Okay, now hopefully you remember that he talks about being in the city a couple times here, right? So he says here, my parents used to worry about some of the things my friend and I, friends and I did in the city, and he also talks about Central Park at the one part here, and so if you know about New York City. You'll know that Central Park is in New York City. Okay. Now, if you didn't know that offhand, that's okay, because remember, it does talk about the city here uh, in the passage. So, one clue here. So, there's a couple different ways to look at this question. One is just think about each answer choice logically and think about the evidence in the passage. Okay. Then also where it says he was raised in the city rather than in the wilderness. So, hopefully you remembered that it said something in the passage about him being from the city. So you could go back and you could look at the parts where he talks about the city. He goes, his movement reminded me of the mimes I had seen in Central Park, right? So the character's intrigued and he's learning and it talks about him being in the city. So we, we learn that he's probably inexperienced working with animals and he's probably not from the wilderness. So this is going to be our answer. Okay. So the answer rationale. The narrator's references to mimes in Central Park and the exclamation, and my parents used to worry about some of the things my friends and I did in New York City, support the inference that he was raised in the city. So basically what I just said. Okay. Which definition best matches the use of the word occupied in paragraph 16? So in this case, we can skip right to paragraph 16 and we can... Uh, basically, we're going to think of all of these definitions and try to put them into the sentence and see if it fits. So let's look at A, to have held a position or office. Okay, so let's look at the word six, let's look at the word occupied in paragraph 16. Okay, and you know, let me give you a chance here. You can pause the video, read the answer choices here for yourself. We have also to have taken or filled up space, to have been a resident or tenant of, to have dwelt in, or to have taken possession or control as by military invasion. All right, so let's look at paragraph 16. And look for that word occupied. So it's right here in paragraph 16. He says, in fact, the only way I could tell he was moving was by looking at the spot he had previously occupied. Okay, so pause the video. Try to figure this out. If you need to rewind it a little bit uh, so that you can see, if you need to check on that sentence or if you need to go back and look at the answer choices, now's your time to do so. 
Okay, so let me break down a good strategy for answering a definition question. So we can take all of these definitions and kind of substitute them in uh, for the word occupied and just see if it would make sense. To have held a position or office. So if we go back down to 16, think, of the, think about it. Would this make any sense? In fact, the only way I could tell he was moving was by looking at the spot he had previously held a position of office. Would that make any sense? I don't think so. So A is out. To have taken up or filled up space, time, etc. To have taken or filled up. So remember that. Now let's see if we can substitute that meaning in for the word occupied in the sentence. In fact, the only way I could tell he was moving was by looking at the spot he had previously to have taken or filled up space, time, etc. Okay, that could make sense. So what about this? To have been a resident or tenant to have dwelt in? So let's go back and think about this again. Okay, it was by looking at the spot he had previously been a resident or tenant or to have dwelt in. So we're not talking about the person moving into a house or to an apartment or anything like that, right? What we're really talking about here is, you know, a, he used to, he was taking up space in a certain place, right? So it says, in fact, the only way I could tell he was moving was by looking at the spot he had occupied. In other words, the spot he had just been, the place where he had just been. Okay. So to have taken possession or control as by military invasion. So that's not what's going on here in the story. It has nothing to do with an invasion or taking possession of a certain place, right? It's just talking about his position, right? Where he was. So this is going to be our correct answer here. So let's look at the answer rationale. It says, when the narrator could tell he was moving by looking at the spot he had previously occupied, he is looking at the physical space Pete had briefly held before moving on to occupy new physical space. All right, and so again, whenever you have a definition question like this, you can kind of read each definition and substitute each one into the sentence for the, the word that they're asking you about. And you can just ask yourself, does this make sense? Okay. So now we have another excerpt here. So here's the question. In this excerpt, Anne asks Marilla to call her, her Cordelia. What does this request reveal about Anne? A. She tries to make her life more interesting. B. She wishes she could fit in better with her peers. C. She feels confused about her own past. Or D. She hesitates to share personal details. Okay, so now I'm going to, let's make the text a little bit bigger, and let's go ahead and we'll read through this. And then, so try to listen, try to follow along here, and try to think about what the answer is as we go along here. One, Marilla came briskly forward as Matthew opened the door. But when her eyes fell on the odd little figure in the stiff, ugly dress, with the long braids of red hair and the eager, luminous eyes, she stopped short in amazement. Matthew... Cuthbert, who's that, she exclaimed. Where is the boy? There wasn't any boy, said Matthew, wretchedly. There was only her. He nodded at the child, remembering that he had never even asked her name. No boy, but there must have been a boy, insisted Marilla. We sent word to Mrs. Spencer to bring a boy. Well, she didn't. She brought her. I asked the station master, and I had to bring her home. She couldn't be left there, no matter where the mistake had come. Well, this is a pretty piece of business, exclaimed Marilla. During this dialogue, the child had remained silent, her eyes roving from one to the other, all the animation fading out of her face. Suddenly, she seemed to grasp the full meaning of what had been said. Dropping her precious car carpet bag, she sprang forward a step and clasped her hands. You don't want me, she cried. I might have expected it. Nobody ever did want me. I might have known it was all too beautiful to last. I might have known nobody really did want me. Oh, but what shall I do? I'm going to burst into tears. Burst into tears she did, sitting down on a chair by the table, flinging her arms out upon it, and burying her face in them, she proceeded to cry stormily. Marilla and Matthew looked at each other, helplessly across the stove. Neither of them knew what to say or do. Finally, Marilla stepped lamely into the breach. Well, well, there's no need to cry about it. Yes, there is need. The child raised her head quickly, revealing a tear-stained face and trembling lips. 
You would cry too if you were an orphan and had to come to a place you thought was going to be home and found that they didn't want you. Oh, this is the most tragical thing that ever happened to me. Something like a reluctant smile, rather rusty from long disuse, mellowed Marilla's grim expression. Well, don't cry anymore. We're not going to turn you out of doors tonight. You'll have to stay here until we investigate this affair. What's your name? The child hesitated for a moment. Call you Cordelia? Is that your name? No, it's not exactly my name. But I would love to be called Cordelia. It's such a perfectly elegant name. I don't know what on earth you mean. If Cordelia isn't your name, what is? Anne Shirley reluctantly faltered forth the owner of the name. But oh, please do call me Cordelia. It can't matter much to what you call me if I'm only going to be here a little while, can it? But Anne is such an unromantic name. Unromantic fiddlesticks, said this unsympathetic Marilla. Anne is a real good, plain, sensible name. You've no need to be ashamed of it. Oh, I'm not ashamed of it, explained Anne. Only I like Cordelia better. I've always imagined that my name was Cordelia. At least, I always have of late years. When I was young, I used to imagine it was Geraldine. But I like Cordelia better now. But if you call me Anne, please call me Anne spelled with an E. What difference does it make how it's spelled, asked Marilla, with another rusty smile as she picked up the teapot. Oh, it makes such a difference. It looks so much nicer. Okay, so a good strategy on the GED test is to only read as much as you have to to answer the questions, right? So you don't necessarily always have to read every single word of every single passage, okay? So, but you do need to read enough until you're able to answer the question. So in this case, right, the, the answer is down near the end of the passage. So you would have to read the whole passage to get to this part of the story here. So remember, we're, the question again is in this excerpt, Anne asked Marilla to call her Cordelia. What does this request reveal about Anne? All right, so go ahead now, pause the video, and re recall what you just heard from the story, and let me know, do you think it's A, B, C, or D? So pause the video, think about it, and then we'll go over it. And if you need to, remember, you can rewind the video, refer back to the text. Okay, so she tries to make her life more interesting. Okay, so that's let's look down here, right? And so for these questions, right, because this is, again, this is an inference, right? We have to make an educated guess. We have to look at the text, the evidence in the text, and we've got to use common sense to get this question right. Okay, so a lot of these answer choices and these kind of inference questions, you can find evidence in the text that directly contradicts them. So she wishes she could fit in better with her peers. Well, it seems like she doesn't care that much about what her peers tell her, right? Uh, because we see down here, she goes, oh, I'm not ashamed of it, explained Anne. Only I like Cordelia better. I've always imagined that my name was Cordelia. So it seems like, she, why would she be ashamed? She's not ashamed of it. She openly says that she's not ashamed of it, right? And so also it says she feels confused about her own past. So we can't really get that. And the part where she's talking about Cordelia, we don't really, we couldn't logically say that she feels confused about her own past, right? Also, she hesitates to share personal details. Well, this is another example where we see evidence that directly contradicts this because she is sharing personal details, right? Because she says, Anne Shirley reluctantly faltered forth the owner of her own name. But oh, please do call me Cordelia. And so she's also saying things like, like this is an unromantic name. And she's reluctantly talking about, she's reluctantly sharing her real name. But then she also goes, she does share personal information here. She's talking about when she was young, she used to imagine it was Geraldine, but she likes Cordelia better now. All right, so basically we see that she is sharing personal details and she doesn't have reservations about that. Uh, we don't see evidence she's confused about her past. Uh, we don't see any evidence that she wishes she could fit in better with her peers, okay? Like she's reluctant about sharing her real name, but we really have to conclude that the reason is because she just likes the name Cordelia better. She tries to make her life more interesting, right? So we can use process of elimination to kind of rule these out, and we can use common sense, and we also want to think about word choice again, all right? Because word choice and looking about the word, looking at the words that authors use is really important. So let's look at the answer rationale. Anne asked to be called Cordelia because it is such a perfectly elegant name, and she believes Anne is such an unromantic name. 
These details imply that Anne wishes to take this more elegant name in an effort to make her life more interesting. So saying elegant, right? So words like elegant and saying Anne is an unromantic name, right? Unromantic and elegant, okay, these are things that you would say about something that's boring or not interesting. All right, so thus we can conclude from the, the word choice that the author used here that the character Anne wants to go by Cordelia to make her life more interesting. Okay, let's look at the next question. So select the correct order of events as they occur in the excerpt. So for a question like this, right, basically your best bet is to just make sure you've read the excerpt and, or at least, right, if you forget the details, then you can always look back at the excerpt. But uh, let's just kind of reason our way through this, and hopefully you remember uh, the order of events in the passage. And if not, remember, as always, you can go back, rewind it, and you can pause it, take your time. So go ahead now, pause the video, and think about this. Which one is correct? We've got A, B, C, or D. Okay, so hopefully you paused the video and had a chance to look at this if you'd like to. So now let's talk about it. So Basically, remember, Matthew explains Anne's presence. And so if you ever forget, one thing that's really important, here's a really important tip, is to always pay attention to the different characters in the story. So you should always know who's talking and to which character they're talking to. So Matthew. So remember, Matthew doesn't really have that big of a role in the story, okay? But at the beginning, Matthew is saying, okay, so... Right, so Cordelia says, Matthew Cuthbert, who's that? She exclaimed, where's the boy? There wasn't any boy, said Matthew wretchedly. There was only her. He nodded at the child, remembering that he had never even asked her her name. So at this part of the story, right, Matthew is explaining what Anne is doing there. So we have to remember that, okay? So the first one is going to be Matthew explains Anne's presence. So just by identifying what happened first in the story, right, we can already rule out answer choices B and C. Okay, so that leaves us with A and that leaves us with D. So what happens next? Marilla tells Anne not to cry, and then Marilla decides Anne can stay for the night, all right? And so if you don't remember from the story, you can just look down here, right? So words like cried, um, and it says burst into tears, she did, so Anne starts crying. Then Cordelia says, well, there's no need to cry. Well, there's no need to cry, so cry about it. Oh, oh, she goes, sorry, I can't even read. Well, well, there's no need to cry so about it. It's because the, the style of English is so different than how most people talk today. But she's telling the kid basically, no, there's no need to cry about it. And then Anne saying, oh, you would cry too. Um, and so then what happens next is eventually, okay, Cordelia tells her that she can stay after all. Okay, so so one is going to be the correct answer here. All right, and so for the answer rationale here, you can pause the video if you want and you can read this more in depth, okay? But really, it's just rehashing of exactly what I just said, which was the order of events in the story. So for these kinds of questions, you're just going to kind of have to, your best bet is to just read the passage and make sure that you've read the passage right. So there's two different ways to really go about this that I think can be problematic. So the first way would be uh, to read the questions and then go directly to hunt and peck, kind of just search for those parts in the passage without really reading the full passage. And so I only recommend that strategy if you're really running low on time, okay? Um, but if you've got time, I would read the passage, right? Just read it at a, at a, at a relaxed pace, but don't, don't take too much time, okay? But don't rush through it so fast that you don't know what's going on, okay? But only read as much as you need to to answer that question. So for a question like this, if you get a question like this, you're going to have to read the full passage. But some other questions, right, maybe you can read the first couple paragraphs and find the answer and then answer that and move on. Okay, so you don't always have to read the whole passage. That can sometimes be a waste of time. Now, on the other hand, though, not reading any of the passage and just reading the question and then going right through the passage to try to find the answer, okay, that can work for some people. And like I said, if you're really pressed for time on the test, then definitely go ahead and use that strategy. It's better than nothing. Okay, but still, all right, oftentimes you end up wasting a lot of time looking for the answer because you don't really understand what's happening in the story. And questions like this are put in here by the GED test taking service, okay, because they want to see if you read the passage or not. So there are questions in the test that you're going to get, and the only way to beat them is to have read the passage, okay, because you can't write, so they write questions to try to throw people off who didn't actually read the passage, and this is one of those. Okay. Moving on now. Okay, so select the three adjectives that best describe Anne's character. 
dramatic enthusiastic disappointed, dramatic enthusiastic practical, practical satisfied disappointed, practical satisfied enthusiastic. Okay, so pause the video now, think about this, which three adjectives best describe Anne's character, and then after that, we'll go over it, and as always, let me just remind you that you can go back and you can look at the excerpt, you can listen to me read it again, or you can kind of search around in it, pause the video as you need to, and then we'll go over this. Okay, so in these questions here, right, what you can kind of look for here, you can look for different patterns, right? Um, dramatic, enthusiastic, disappointed. Okay, dramatic, enthusiastic, practical. Right, so note here that in this answer choice here, we don't see the word practical. Okay, so in this one, B, C, and D, we do see that word practical. So let's think about it, right? Is there any evidence in this passage that Anne is practical? Well, we don't see evidence that disproves that she's practical, but at the same time, we care about evidence that proves that she is practical. Okay, and we don't really see that. So right off the bat here, okay, if you were pressed for time on your test, I would just rule these, I would rule out B, C, and D, and I would probably just guess A, okay, just based off that. But also, you know, so a good strategy is to look for words that show up in, in you know, three out of the four answer choices. Like another example would be enthusiastic. We see enthusiastic in A and B, and also in D. Okay, so we could think, is an enthusiastic? All right, and if she's not, then we would rule these answer choices out. Okay, um, all right, so that's one kind of way to do it is to just kind of think and reason your way through it, okay? Or you can just think about what really happened in the passage, okay? So is Anne enthusiastic? Is she dramatic? Now, in remember, dramatic. Well, if you read the piece, you would remember that she was crying, and she was saying, you don't want me. I might have expected it. Nobody ever did. Um, and so we could say that's evidence that she is dramatic and she's clearly disappointed, right? Remember the part where I think she drops her bag. It says dropping her precious carpet bag. She sprang forward a step and clasped her hands. Uh, suddenly she seemed to grasp the full meaning of what was said. You don't want me. She burst into tears. Um, and so clearly she's disappointed here. Okay. And so then also, all right, she is enthusiastic and evidence for this comes I would say near the end here where she's talking about her name and, and something like a re reluctant smile, rather rusty from the long disuse mellowed Marilla's grim expression. Okay, so it's saying here that Anne, she hasn't really smiled in a while, but she's starting to smile and that's mellowing, all right, Marilla's grim expression. And then she's also talking about her last name, she or not her last name, her nickname that she wants to go by, which is Cordelia. And so, all right, so we see that much here. Um, and she's enthusiastic about it. We do see some evidence for that. So I would say that this is going to be our answer here. So the rationale goes, you must first consider Anne's personality, including what she says and how she interacts with the other characters in the excerpt. Anne is a dramatic young lady who is brimming with enthusiasm, but is disappointing in her current situation. Congratulations for making it through the video. Your next step is to check out my next video for more GED RLA practice. And if you've yet to subscribe to my channel, hit that subscribe button down below for more videos like this to help you pass the GED test. This is Parker from Test Prep Champions teaching you how to pass the GED fast, and I wish you the best of luck with your test.